years old and found myself fascinated by the the industrial hum that was always around me uh, even f everything from my father's electric shaver which was all the time to the electric space heater in our metal trailer uh, when I was about nine I was taken on a tour of the Ford Motor Company assembly main assembly plant at the River Rouge and there I saw my first machine press. A machine press is a giant, basically, it's, it's a, metal, a metal foundation and a giant piece of very heavy metal cut in a form. And then you put what's about to become a fender in the middle and it <laughs> crashes down and you pull out the formed metal and put another piece in. I loved that sound. I began to play the drums around the house. When I was 14, my parents loaned me the money to get my first drum set, and I joined the musicians' union, put together a band in high school called the Iguanas. Mm -hmm. uh, we played weekends for college fraternity dances, high school sock hops, and private parties for the next four years of my life, 14 to 18. I had enrolled for college in the University of Michigan for one semester uh, for September uh, September semester of 1966 or no that was still 65 yeah because I graduated school in 65 so I went back home to Ann Arbor the band broke up the rest of them went on to become bankers or divorcees or whatever people do <laughs> and and uh, I went I went to school, to college, which basically consisted of going to the student union in the morning, drink a lot of coffee with sugar in it, and sitting eating donuts and thinking, God, I don't really want to be here and do this. This is a bunch of shit. Oh, my God. And I'd fall asleep, miss the first class, and then think, if I've missed this class, why not just miss the whole day? At the same time, I was playing in a band called the Prime Movers. I did that for about six months until I'd, I was... I passed my 19th birthday in April, and I thought, I've gotten everything out of this town I can. 
Uh, the band, the Prime Movers, was the number one band in town. Uh, I had studied all my old blues records. I had studied all my English Invasion records. I knew, I already knew my Stones and Bob Dylan by heart. So I decided I wanted to go to Chicago and investigate the blues. important turning point in my life was the way when these men played the music it almost dripped off their fingers like tree sap like honey it was just oozing out of these guys and the way they the way they moved was very loose very like this when they when they did the music and it was, it was not a studied thing and I thought my god you know I'm free white 19 I'm not 45, 50 years old, and I'm not a Chicago blues man. What I've got to do now is I've got to, I've got to take what I've learned here, and I've got to apply it to my own experience. I'm going to go home to Detroit, and I'm going to find three or four guys who are not impressed with the music scene, who do not want to imitate British bands, who do not want to do cover songs, and we're going to make a music that will blow the roof off our town. Out of the protests over the Vietnam War and the racial violence in 1967, Detroit saw the rise of a band called the Stooges. Their lead singer was known as Higgy. No fun for my babe. No fun. No fun for my babe. No fun. No fun to hang around or feel the last same old way. No fun to hang around or freak out for another day. first rehearsal spots. This is the uh, basement of my mother's place. At that time, I discovered the famous uh, three-finger bar chord. So a lot of just, uh, you know, all, a lot of songs came from that, like No Fun was simply moving. I used to just like... I came from listening to all that Ravi Shankar and stuff, you know. So, yeah, it's simple and same with, like, um, um, I Want to Be Your Dog. It started out just being a jam. That it's that magical three fingers. This, this one you didn't bar, you could just find, you could just... Same thing, I Want to Be Your Dog is, uh, the title came from, you see some girl that you really liked and, uh, what's the crudest, but kind of polite thing you could say, well, hey, baby, I want to be your dog. You know, that's like, all the titles came from, like, real life slang. There was a lot of always hassle about turn those amps down. And to us, the volume was the spirit of the music. To play clean and quiet, you couldn't get into it. It wasn't like, and the, and the songs were so simple, the power, the actual physical power of the amplifier, that's what brought the song to life. <laughs>
reason we're here is this is uh, where we were discovered by Danny Fields. We got done playing. It's the same stage. Place was packed. You know, imagine uh, late, this was late 60s, like mm -hmm. 1968. He was a PR for Elektra Records. And he hung out with the Velvet Underground. Uh -huh. And uh, he was wearing, you know, shades, the leather jacket. So we get off stage. And he goes, uh, how would you guys like to be uh, stars? Oh, yeah, <laughs> right, sure. Throw this guy out. Yeah, he was serious. We used to get those big amps cranking, and this room just rang. It was like the, the sound just bounced. You can hear from this. Just imagine Marshall Stacks at 10. It was so loud, it was hypnotic. And it would actually, physically, the, the sound would assault your body where you couldn't get away from it. You'd feel the bass drum through the PA or the bass guitar cranked on 10. You could feel it inside. inside. And that way, you couldn't escape it no matter where you went. A lot of times I would break a guitar, either on purpose. A lot of times I left with bloody hands, or I would just bang the guitar so hard that my hand would be swollen, not feeling any pain until we were done. This is what we call just let one go. Every guy would do his own free form. They walk off stage, I remember so many times, a beautiful harmony feedback. If you actually hear mm, go through the different tones, just the whole room, it's like you, mm, it's just, you're swallowed up in it, and we just leave the stage. And the roadies would let the amps go for maybe five minutes, come off and click it off. And everyone would just be, huh? Do some Stooges song. Oh yeah. If you want to give sure. your opinion on that, it's wrong. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> song come about um, it started it started as the first two chords like most Stooges songs we were we were stoned on our smoke and jamming and Ron came up with the two chords over and over which is just uh, this one just those two back and forth and then I was I was the one who said I had been a I had been a written poetry in high school and songs in my early bands I was the one who said, let's take this and do a little more with it, make it into a song. And I used Johnny Cash's I Walk the, I'll Walk the Line as a model for this. If you, you could actually hear it, if you listen to I Walk the Line, you got to keep a close walk on this. Let's see, wait. Wait a minute. Yep. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. Boom, I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I yeah. keep the ends out for the eyes that bind because you're mine. I walk the line. So we used that structure in this song. Then the middle eight is a typical Stones middle eight because I did use a lot of from the Stones. I really? took a lot from them. Yeah, and the Velvets, a lot from the Velvets, which was like a the Velvets at that time was an influential art band and, and yeah. affected affected me a lot. Um, and then the words were just again. The words were an attempt. What we didn't want to do is sing a song like, Oh, baby, I'm going to keep on rocking, and I'm going to rock your pussy, and I'm going to rock your little ears, and rock, rock, rock. <laughs> you know, that was right out. I uh -huh. wanted to make songs about how we were living in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. and what was this life about? And basically, there was just there was no fun and nothing to do. Mm -hmm. So I wrote about that. Listen 
House, yeah, this is house also where we, um, like most people at that time, uh, experimented with drugs. And those experiments with the drugs, how did that go? Was it, was it very heavy? Just it, well, this was, this was the first place that we all took acid. We, we tr I know Jim tripped almost every day for a summer here. Mm -hmm. And this, right, d right down the street, as a matter of fact, was our uh, local dope dealer where we would score our acid. You know, it was, for me, it was like a once a week thing, but that's how we thought. You know, we really got to know each other and formulated that real tightness that carried us through. Mm -hmm. We were actually also um, selling lids of marijuana out of this house. And many times uh, the police would come to the door, but they'd be undercover agents, you know, with crew cuts, white socks, and brown shoes <laughs> going. As soon as you see him, you know that it's the man. So, But I don't know, luck was with us, and we never got popped. You, you get to know yourselves in here. Yes. Did you talk about what kind of music Always you wanted to make? Always listening. The whole experience in this house consisted of talking about music, practicing. But this is where we listened to a lot of music and got what, like... What, for example? What well, music? when we first lived here, the Jimi Hendrix first album came out. And our manager, who became our manager, went to uh, the Monterey Pop Festival where Hendrix first played. I remember it was like nine in the morning. We never left our door. We never locked our door. He came busting, going, "I've got this great music you won't believe." Mm -hmm. So once that hooked us to Hendrix, we listened to it day and night, day and night. Ook voor de Stooges eisten de experimenten met drugs hun tol. Binnen twee jaar viel de groep als loszand uit elkaar. Oorzaak: heroïne. It started off where they would just snort a little bit, and then it got into shooting. Once they went through all the band's funds. Then equipment started missing. I go to the practice room and I'm going, hey, where's that electric piano? And they started trading amplifiers and musical equipment for nothing what it was worth. You know, like for a spoon. What was a spoon of heroin was going for? $25. And uh, people actually got up to having hundreds of dollars a day spent on, you know, keeping their drug habits going. Just things started missing. Um, the word got out. Um, started getting late to jobs. Drugs really started to interfere with the actual performance of the band. Then people were so swept away by just, you know, physically sick if they didn't have it. Their whole life revolved around getting high and the band was completely forgotten. De Stooges zelf verdwenen, maar hun muzikale erfenis die bleef. Honderden punkbands grepen halverwege de jaren 70 terug naar de sound van de Stooges. En talloze gitaarrockgroepen van nu zeggen erdoor te zijn beïnvloed. Tijdens zijn concert in Utrecht onderkende Iggy zelf ook het belang van zijn werk uit die tijd. Een aanzienlijk deel van het repertoire stamde uit de roemruchte jaren van de Stooges.
Het rauwe straatgeluid van Iggy en de Stooges werd in 1976 nieuw leven ingeblazen door een groepje dat het gezicht van de rock'n'roll drastisch zou veranderen. In 1977 bracht Iggy Pop de erkenning die lang was uitgebleven. Samen met David Bowie maakte hij de LP's The Idiot en Lust for Life. De songs daarvan groeiden uit tot manifesten van de punkbeweging. in 1975, he invited me to come along on his world tour, Station to Station, in 76. And I had never seen anybody in my life work as hard as that guy did. I mean, he was getting up, he was getting up at eight in the morning to travel by car, because he didn't fly, to by car all day to gig. In the car would always be a fresh collection of the newest tapes by artists from all over the world studying the stuff, listening to it. To, okay, Tom Waits, he knew about Tom Waits before anybody. Kraftwerk, he knew about Kraftwerk mm -hmm. before anybody. So not just, oh, I'm into this kind of music, man, and that's all I like. He gets to the, to the town, does a couple of interviews, catches a half hour sleep, and he's on stage doing the show. Then after the show, the guy won't stop. He's out checking out whatever band is in town, knocking on his guitarist's door at four in the morning, let's write a new song. I was exhausted just watching it. I had never been exposed. Up till then, you got to remember, I basically, in many ways, I had never been even exposed to proper touring. And I watched what he was doing, and I said, I'm going to do that too someday. I said, this guy's really learned, knows what it is to work. No wonder he's doing so well, and I'm not. Iggy learned a lot from Bowie, but Bowie himself did also his advantage with the samenwerking. In 1983 scoorde Bowie een wereldhit met een song die hij samen met Iggy schreef. De Amerikaanse schrijfster Ann Rearer vergezelde Iggy tijdens zijn tournee in 1981 om ervaringen op te doen voor het schrijven van de Iggy Pop biografie I Need More. Ze ondervond aan den lijve hoe het er dan wel aan toe gaat. One girl followed him, you know, like from one town to the next town to the next town. I'm sure this has happened lots and lots of times. What do you break her heart? She's not getting in the door every night. 
but they've come with notes, they've come with love stories, they've come with letters, they've come with flowers, they've come with the Jack Daniels he likes, they've come with any drug you can imagine. I mean, we even had Elvis Presley's doctor at the door. I mean, come on, or, uh, you know. One girl told me a Bruce Springsteen story where she wanted to actually kill herself, and then she decided better to kill him because then he would be hers. And I thought, that is very, very heavy uh, about being a rock star. is still very much, very much alive, but he's kind of under my management now. And when I get excited about a subject or talking, I'll talk like I'm talking to you. My voice even goes up a couple octaves. If I'm going to control myself, then I speak in a lower register like this. The face becomes more calm. The eyes contract suspicion sets in. My mind is sizing up the people around me, what I'm doing, and how it may profit me. But then we're back to the other <laughs> You see what I mean? Uh -huh. So you've got these two people, and that's kind of how I keep it together. <laughs> Tell my friends, gonna tell them all that I'm a wild one. Oh yeah, I'm 
like a wild wolf. I'm gonna break it loose, gonna keep on moving wild. Keep on swimming, baby, I'm a real wild child. Never had contact with Iggy since those days. Uh, gee, I can't even remember. Probably the last time I saw him is when he uh, played um, the Second Chance in Ann Arbor. And that that must have been like four years ago. You know, now that his parents have moved from Ann Arbor, he has no real reason to come back. Perhaps I'll see him when he comes back when he's a new album out, and you know, I'm sure they'll tour. If he calls me up and gives me backstage passes, I'll go to his show. Mm -hmm. But you still talk, you're not enemies or something? No, not really. I, you know, I'm, I'm always glad to see him. We've been through so much together. Even if there is you know, some sort of bitterness, once, when you see the guy, you, know, you just flood back all the good things. Mm -hmm. He tends to forget the bad. What's the bitterness then about? Well, for me, um, the drug thing, uh, well, I really thought the Stooges had a chance to be like the American Rolling Stones. You know, and I really put a lot of time and energy, and I never wanted it to, you know, go away. And I know under certain circumstances would stop something, but that for me, the chance not to continue on with something that I think would have been really still happening today, how much better we would have gotten and grown.